Thank you so much for having me. I actually wore a very special T-shirt here today. I have my cloud and data center conference T-shirts. I had to wear that for some nostalgia for when, you know, we could speak in person. So, you know, I think the, the biggest question that I have, and you can wait to the end to the Q&A, but when is CDC coming back? Because I desperately want to come back and visit you guys in uh, Germany for that. So I hope I hope it's soon because you know virtual virtual conferences are cool, but I like to actually meet people as well. Dave, that's the same for me. Uh, unfortunately, I decided to do it in 2023, but you will be invited, of course. Well, fantastic, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. The show's uh, been great so far. You know, I, I always learn a lot myself when I, I come to these these types of shows. And, you know, your presentation early in the morning, I was actually up, I caught the tail end of that. So I caught a little bit of DJs before I went back to bed at 6 a.m. And, uh, and Lisa and the presentation on Dell and then Cosmos on the roadmap was pretty awesome. So, um, I have to give a little bit of a precursor for, for my session, um, Karsten. I've been told that I have to dial back my sessions a little bit when I talk about security and ransomware because apparently they can be scary, but you know they need to be scary because there's a reality in this world that we live in that there's a lot of bad guys that are out there that try to break the, the cool infrastructure that we set up. And so hopefully you take a few little uh, gold nuggets out of this. Uh, my last uh, project that I worked on for ransomware defense was unfortunately a friend of mine had an ISP, uh, MSP actually, that got impacted by that Kaseya attack and uh, took out a lot of their customers. So I've got a few notes from the fields and I also want to talk in this session particularly about having some advanced persistent threat protection um, as well as taking and having endpoint detection and responses being a really critical part to your solution design. All right, you can follow me on Twitter at Dave Kawula. I'm always available if you have questions after the show. Um, I'm always available to uh, to help out. Let's see if I can advance my slide. I'm using the web version of this. All right, a little bit about myself. I'm a Microsoft MVP now going on 10 years. I just got my little blue puck that went at the top of my uh, of my little MVP statue that I have. And uh, that's that's a pretty huge accomplishment because for all of those 10 years, it was uh, it was about 10 years ago that I had a chance to meet you, Karsten, at our first MVP summit, and we were the we were the loners in the room. We were the Hyper V guys. We got to hang out with Ben and Sarah, and we got to learn about all the new cool things that were coming up. And man, has everything grown up over these last uh, 10 years. So I've met an incredible network of friends that are all Hyper-V experts from around the world and we've branched out into different technologies, but we're all still core Hyper-V MVPs at heart. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, I guess I'm the old guy now or one of the old guys, 25 years industry experience. It seems like yesterday that I started to do this. This really kicked in for me because my oldest son graduated this year. He's 18 years old and, um, and so he's, he's off on his own. When I'm not doing IT, I'm a dad of seven and a full-time driver and coach of many different sports. I run my own consulting company called Tricon Elite Consulting, co-chair a conference called uh, Tech Mentor, which is coming up in November. That one's actually going to be in person. Uh, written lots of books, spoken all around the world, and my hobbies that I have are hockey, fishing, dirt biking, and old cars. So that's what I do. And I'm based out of Canada. So if you hear me have any Canadian slips for, for, for English, that's you'll be able to tell pretty quick because when I get excited, you'll hear me say A, you'll hear me say stuff like roof and things like that. And I hope that's okay for everyone. Um, you can understand what I'm saying. You can check out some of my resources on my blog at checkyourlogs.net. Um, on YouTube, I didn't have a chance to put the short form URL in there, so just search for me on YouTube at uh, Dave Kabula. All of my books are available on LeanPub in PDF downloadable format, and make sure that you join up to the Azure Stack HCI Slack channel. Great uh, resource for anybody that's interested in this tech. All right, so now let's get into the meat of the presentation. 
So number one, uh, when it comes to security, you need to stay informed. And you know, social media is still your friend. If you're not a fan of Twitter, you should still be a fan of Twitter for you know the this, the context of security because I find that that's still where we're finding out about most of uh, attacks that are coming out and things like that. So if you're not on social media, you need to be on social media and stay up to date um, from a security standpoint. Um, the second thing is, is that it's everyone's security is everyone's responsibility. It's no longer just the SecOps team that has to look after security. And, you know, I almost have my audiences make a pledge with me that we are all IT security professionals now. We all have a responsibility in protecting infrastructure. So it's not just this one individual that lives in a closet that nobody really knows where they are in the building anymore. Uh, we have teams that are dedicated for this now and you can take you can get help uh, very easily. The big statement here is that you only know what you know. I find that security has been very interesting for me, especially being brought in the uh, cybersecurity insurance vendors to help with ransomware recovery efforts. And every time I've done one of these, I've done 10 ransomware recoveries in the past two and a half years. Um, something new with every single one that I go through. So don't be scared to continue your education. You want to make sure that you're staying on top of this. And like I said, you only know what it is that you know, so you need help. And you know what, what, where, where can help come from? So <laughs> this is, this is the not so nice part about hyperconverged infrastructure and in S2D is that what happens when you have an active threat actor inside of your network and you have a potential ransomware attack that's impacting either your Azure Stack HCI infrastructure or your storage spaces direct S2D infrastructure. Well, the first question that I have for you is, um, was the attack an admin level attack? Did the threat actors gain access to a domain admin attack, uh, domain admin credentials? And with that, were they, e were they able to easily spread and move laterally through the infrastructure and quickly deliver C2 payloads and uh, then in turn infect the infrastructure? And so that's always one of the first questions I ask. I get the phone call late at night saying, Dave, we've got a problem. And I, I just, I pray that they don't say that, you know, we got the note, we got the ransomware note, they got us, what do we do? first question I ask is, did they get admin? Because if they got admin, then it's typically very, very bad. We're looking at recoveries via uh, backups or replicas, if that's even viable. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, uh, because in order to understand why you need advanced persistent threat protection and endpoint detection and response, first you have to understand why. So the second question I ask uh, is, do the, do the customers have a fabric? And what does that mean? Do they have a separate domain? Do they have a separate security boundary where they've installed their hyperconverged infrastructure? Kind of a protected zone, because if the primary domain was attacked, do we have a secondary domain that we can restore back into? And if we do, we've got options. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about this later on in the presentation. When the attackers got in, did they go after your cluster shared volumes? Did they go after your VHDXs? Did they go after um, did they go after the core operating system? And this is actually very interesting because a lot of the ransomware attacks um, they're actually set up to not corrupt the the operating system of the servers that they attack, and that's actually something interesting to me because in almost every single attack that we've had and i've had a few that we've had to pay for the recovery key um the core operating system is trashed like it, it is not recoverable it, we put the key in we get our data back but the windows directory the core os install is not good so what that means for your your s2d hosts or your azure stack hci hosts is that potentially you're looking at an OS reinstall scenario. And if it got your VMs and you had no backups available and you were having to go put the key in to try to recover everything, yeah, great, I got your data back. I got your SQL servers back. I got your, your SQL server databases back, um, but no front ends. So you have to go rebuild your SQL servers. You've got to go rebuild your IS application servers because the OS is trash sitting on top of that. So it's so important that we take a proactive stance and to, to jump in front of this before the attack ever gets us. So July 2nd, I got a phone call. 
The phone call came from a friend of mine that was, uh, he was the president of a managed service provider. And I hadn't even heard about the, the whole Kaseya uh, ransomware attack that was out. It was, it had just hit a few days prior. And the unfortunate reality was, is they, they did have that management server set up and it gave the threat actors system level access to over 80 tenants that they had. So over 80 clients had system level access, agents deployed on servers, agents deployed on desktops. And within a matter of an hour, they had 80 customers, not systems, 80 customers impacted by this particular attack. It was like the fastest spreading ransomware attack I've ever seen. It got the Hyper-V hosts, it got the backup targets, it got everything where that agent was on there and had system level access. There was really no stopping it. And so going through that, the, the cyber insurance uh, vendor and the, the cyber threat team that we were working with, um, they actually gave us access to a GitHub site where it had a, a Revel ransomware configuration file. And so this is going for the first time in a live presentation. I'm going to go through a couple slides just to show you what the anatomy of a ransomware attack actually looks like. Because like I said, in order to protect against this, we have to have an understanding of what it is that we're protecting against. And so this was a real eye opener for me. I put the link on the site. I'll give the slides and make them available for Carson post show as well. And uh, at the end of the uh, of my presentation, I'll put it up in the chat if you do want to copy that link because it's this is kind of that little gold nugget. So the global ransomware attack of Kaseya. I saw numbers, I saw this on CNN, I saw the, the US, the, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, talking about this particular attack and saying, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. A couple thousand customers that were hit and I'm like, okay, so my friend's company had 80 customers themselves and there was reports that I had seen going on that were way higher than that. I think those numbers were like in the tens of thousands of customers that were hit by this. And this is probably the worst case scenario for, for any type of defense that you had available because those agents that were in there had system level access. And so it really was an unstoppable ransomware attack. Like once it executed, there was no going back from it. So let's take a look and see what that uh, Revel configuration file looked like. So in that GitHub repo, there's a configuration file that walks you through what the, the ransomware attack actually looked like. And a couple of interesting pieces inside of here was, and I'm not gonna point out all of these, I'm just gonna pick a few items that were interesting to me. The first one was encryption type. Do you wanna encrypt the whole file or do you wanna just encrypt part of the file? Because if I'm a bad guy, I can use a hex editor on like a VHDX file, for example, and I can just modify one byte inside of that file. I can just take one, one byte of, of data and I can modify it. It's not gonna CRC and it's not gonna work properly. So if I'm lazy and I wanna encrypt your system faster, I can just encrypt like the headers of the files and they're, they're gonna be no good to you. You still have to decrypt them the same way. But it, what it means is I can actually spread through your system a lot faster, not having to wait for the encryption engine to actually kick in. And so there's actually variables inside of there. The next one was like wipe selected folders true. Okay, well, what exact folders were we hunting for inside of there? And so we go through and they said, oh, well, here's, here's a bunch of whitelisted folders that we're not gonna touch. So just as a heads up, um, the code that ran for this particular piece of ransomware didn't actually listen to any of this whitelist stuff because I had a whole bunch of data that was in program data and I had a whole bunch of data that was in the Windows directory that were encrypted as well because we could see the file structures inside of there. So it wasn't really listening to this all that well and that's why the core OS kind of got blown up. But there was a whitelist. There were some file extensions to skip. There were some file names to skip inside of there too. Seems like some logical way of taking and delivering a payload. Seems like a, a pretty interesting application. And anybody that's interested in tech, when you look at the delivery of a ransomware payload, it's just an executable that listens to this as basically an any file. And so the any file is just giving instruction sets. Oh, here's some good ones. How about processes to kill? Okay, if I find anything with SQL Server, if I find anything that's gonna take and have the, the name backup in it, I'm gonna wipe that. That's fantastic for your backup targets that you have all your backups stored in a folder called eDrive Backup because now I just wiped all the backups. And so <laughs> ironically enough, there's a lot of backup targets that are out there that are actually in a folder called Backup. And so um, it was it's kind of neat to me to see what 
the anatomy of what this thing was actually doing. And then services to stop. Oh, so a couple of other ones that were in here was like, oh, do you run Veeam? Oh, well, we're just going to stop that service. You use VSS. Do you have Sophos for antivirus? Well, let's go kill those processes. And then let's take and let's elevate because a couple of the other pieces that are in here, there's some elevation commands. And then the most interesting piece to that file and that link is they have a whole list of C2 servers, command and control servers. There's a giant list that's in there of all of these um, of all of these uh, FQDNs of all the C2 servers that these things would go communicate with. So if you want a list of things to blacklist on your firewall, that's probably a pretty good start for you. Now that stuff's obviously going to change faster than you can go through it. But at the end of the day, we go back to my early point. You only know what you know. And so kind of breaking apart the guts of, of what this does makes it a little more interesting to understand as to why we need to uh, take and be more diligent and have more than just traditional antivirus on our systems. So <laughs> traditional antivirus isn't good enough. Um, is such a true statement. It's listening to a very good friend of mine, Jeremy Moskowitz. You probably know him as the godfather of group policy. You probably read some of his white papers, some of his books along the way as you're configuring something in group policy. He runs a great company called Policy Pack, and uh, he gave a presentation that I listened to about uh, six months ago, and it was actually uh, notes from the field for a threat actor that took home, I think, $4 million with ransomware. And this, and this was interesting because the threat actor actually gave tips to organizations for how they could protect against um, ransomware and against uh, attacks from coming in. And so the biggest point that I pulled out of there was traditional antivirus by itself is not enough. It's easy enough for us to stop those services, gain access and, and get into the systems um, and, and work around traditional antivirus. And so he's like, you need to have advanced persistent threat protection. You need to have endpoint detection and response. And what's coming baked into the operating system is just, it's not enough by itself. So with, with server 2016, I think was the first version of Defender that came on a server platform for Microsoft in 2019, 2022, and Azure Stack HCI, Defender is in there. Defender antivirus is in there. So you have some level of protection that's inside of there. And the way I equate this is almost like putting the free version of antivirus that you'd find on your home computers, and that's what you're running for your corporate enterprise. It's not enough. It's lacking all the enterprise controls, a console, and if something does happen and there's a virus that pops up in there, where do all of the alerts and logs go if they're not centralized somewhere? So the answer to this that Microsoft has had prior to uh, what I'll show you uh, towards the end of the presentation was Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection. And so uh, Defender Advanced Threat Protection came with its own portal. Um, you could take and you could load this up on your server 2019 S2D farms. It's just, that's the place that I, I play in a lot. And uh, you could get that advanced threat protection, that endpoint detection response. You could protect yourself. You could run that on all of those workloads as well. So it, it's been available. Microsoft's had a good answer, but now I call that almost like a generation one. So we'll take a look at gen one first and then we'll see where gen two is going with this. So with, with the setup of this advanced threat protection, first place that you need to go is you need to go to securitycenter.microsoft.com if you're looking at the gen one version of this. And don't worry for my friends at Microsoft, I'll talk about the Gen 2 stuff in a minute here. This is just the Gen 1 piece. This is this is part of uh, part of what we had to work with over the years. And inside of securitycenter.microsoft.com, this was your portal for uh, advanced threat protection. And most people thought about this for endpoints, just like Windows 10 endpoints, but there was also a SKU for servers as well. And so this worked incredibly well on my server 2019 builds that we would deploy S2D on. And it, it met the measures that were required for uh, cyber recovery from the cyber insurance vendors. Because one of the very first things that happens during a ransomware uh, recovery effort is the cyber insurance vendors and the, the cybersecurity organizations, one of the very first things they're asking us to do is put on some, of advanced, some type of advanced threat protection so we can see if the threat is still persisting. Because what's the point in taking and uh, what's the point in taking and recovering everything if the bad guys still have command and control servers inside of there? If the bad guys are still in there, 
then you know what what do we have to do? Um, so that's what they asked for, and this is this is accepted for them. So typically, I see something like a VMware Carbon Black is one of the ones that they'll lead with, or a Defender Advanced Star Protection. So for the last couple that we've done, we've done Defender ATP, and it's sufficed for us. The agent actually directly connects up to the cloud. We get a, a great little portal, and we get real time views of the vulnerabilities, um, indicators of compromise, things like that. You know, it's all structured around the MITRE framework, and it's the pieces that you're missing from the enterprise antivirus that, you know, you really need, all right? And so, anyways, um, this this piece here and the alert that you see was actually uh, a Mimicat's alert that popped up. I was doing some testing in my lab, and so it actually detected that uh, Mimicat's was on one of my servers because, you know, it's not good enough to just deploy. You have to test as well. And so, with the ATP pieces, um, I find that, that I put them on almost all of my production um, S2D deployments today. Um, I don't really advise customers, especially having, having gone through the ransomware recovery efforts, to not use this. And so this is what we had in the past. And you know, I also recommend that this is put on any of the server workloads that you have. And this is the same messaging that Microsoft has coming, like moving forward. And so when we take a look at, you know, the, the ability to protect our infrastructure and our investments, like I said, you only know what you know, and having the ability of having a security operations center and a, a cloud-based NOC that Microsoft would provide for us is incredibly valuable because most organizations don't have the manpower to look after this themselves. So that's why having a trusted partner is just so important for us. So a couple of the pieces that I really like about the, uh, the ATP engine is the automated investigation capabilities and threat hunting capabilities. So when something bad happens, it's not good enough to just pop up an alert message saying, hey, something happened on here and you know we detected this particular file and we quarantined it because that's the world that we've lived in from an antivirus perspective over the years is just get a file quarantine it deal with it block it on the firewall you know that's that's where we go well with advanced threat protection with atp capabilities we can gather evidence we can see the logs i can see the number of systems that were impacted how many devices were impacted by this particular threat I can watch the threat moving laterally through my infrastructure. And most importantly, as I'm hunting for you know, traces of this still being out there, I can now inline isolate those devices where we can take and I can actually turn them off from a network perspective and only leave a back communication channel up to the cloud, up to your ATP provider and up to your ATP portal. So you know, now I can actually stop this thing from spreading, especially if this is the source of our uh, C2 instance where somebody's actually jumping through here to get inside of our infrastructure. And so we can start to lock this down. So this, this is a big piece that doesn't come with traditional antivirus. And this is one of the reasons why I need this. I speak to this primarily around the, the server landscape um, because you know I, I see organizations just you know rolling upgrades of, of servers and infrastructure. And this is also a really great reason if you're if you're not on the latest generation of operating system like server 2019 or server 2022 you need to get there because some of these pieces are not fully supported on the older operating systems so you may still be in a support life cycle for that operating system but that doesn't mean that you're going to be getting all of the the threat protection features that your organization is going to need so it's a pretty good motivator to get there i know it's not that easy for organizations i've been a professional consultant for going on 25 years now i know that all of this is a process but taking a posture and sitting back and burying your head in the sand it's not it's not good enough so the next, the next big piece is uh, along that initial statement at the, that I made at the beginning of the presentation. And it was, uh, you only know what you know, and you, you don't know what's wrong with your infrastructure. And a lot of organizations will do a biannual IT audit or maybe even an, an annual audit. Maybe they don't even do an IT audit, I'm not sure. Um, but part of that is, is going through a security vulnerability assessment. And so what I've found is that most organizations will do that a couple times a year. They'll get a tool or they'll get a third party consultant in to do it. 
And you know, that's that's not really good enough anymore. You need to do this real time. So the great part about the, the ATP agents that Microsoft provides is that they do provide real time vulnerability assessments. So we can actually see what, um, what holes we have inside of our infrastructure. And it drives down beyond just the core operating system level because a lot of the holes in the operating system come from the application stack that's installed. So for example, take a, take a, a workload that's running as an RDSH host. And that RDSH host has a bunch of applications that are published through RD Web or something like that. Well, those apps need to be updated as well. And so my question for you as IT professionals, do you stay on top of every single application that you have deployed in your fleet and make sure that all of those holes are, are closed? Or are you just taking the posture of, well, I'm patching the operating system and that's good enough. Well, remember there's things that ride on top of the operating system. And those things that ride on top of the operating system, especially the workloads that are driven by either S2D or Azure Stack HCI, need to be protected as well, because that could become a backdoor getting into your into your infrastructure. And like the landscape of, of critical exploits that are coming out via browsers, like for example, Chrome exploits, you've got you've got exploits coming out via via if you still have Java installed, all of these pieces because you've got old applications out there, you know, it, at least it helps you. And it gives you a scorecard as well. So it says, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to score you really bad for your organization if you're not getting your patches up to date. So we're going to give you a bad score for that. So then when you go to take that scorecard up to management saying, hey, listen, this is this is how good we're doing. It's going to reflect not very well for you. So vulnerability assessments are key and it's a piece that just comes as part of the solution. The next piece of this is the remediation levels. What do you want to do if threats are discovered? And so there's various types of remediation levels that you can have in the uh, Defender ATP portal. Um, I found some issues um, just as a heads up if you're going to be loading this up on backup targets. So if you're backing up your S2D infrastructure with Veeam like many of us do, um, I found issues on some of those backup targets running the, um, the advanced threat protection agents from, uh, from Defender um, on those Veeam backup targets. They stopped communicating properly and that was in the full remediate mode. We had to dial that back a little bit on those backup targets to get it to work. And we had some tickets with Microsoft to work our way through that. Um, ensure you're testing this on your production servers. That's not going to impact um, any issues that you have. And from what I've seen outside of those Veeam backup targets, the full remediation is normally um, fairly safe to, to roll with, but I'm a realist as well. So you need to make sure that you're always testing this from a production perspective. All right, so now generation two. So what does generation two look, for, look like for us? So Microsoft's key investments that they have um, and you know, kind of the, the statements that I, I heard coming back from the, the product teams, was that you know Defender ATP was never really the home for servers, and so you know that was that was there was a SKU that was built. It was more of like the endpoint solution that was available. Um, but where's the new home? So the new home for this is inside of Microsoft Security Center. It's called Azure Defender. You can you can take and you can either have a free version or you can have a paid version of this. It's a pay by VM uh, type pricing model. And you can take and you can have support for this, um, not only inside of your Azure, uh, your full Azure workloads, so full cloud workloads, hybrid workloads, multi-cloud workloads, and, and the deployment of this is, is done and supported uh, via Azure Arc. And so that Azure Arc deployment can and take and happen through a PowerShell script that you generate. Uh, just a generic script, admin center, but you've got to deploy the agents out there so that you can take and that you can communicate and so that they'll then show up inside of the portal. Then once that happens, of course, you're going to get some additional features that are outside of Defender Advanced Threat Protection. And, you know, one of the big ones for me is just-in-time VM access. This is one of the big features that we get asked about all of the time. And so that's a big one, vulnerability assessment management that we talked about earlier. Um, and also there's a new tab inside of Security Center that provides regulatory compliance. So if your organization has to conform with ISO standards, NIST, HIPAA for healthcare, you know, this is not something that you just snap your fingers and, and have uh, a compliance infrastructure. 
you know, HIPAA compliance, for example, has regulations for like SQL Server databases with encryption. So those settings need to be configured. And so, so the regulatory compliance piece of this is actually incredibly valuable, especially if your organization is in the process of heading down that direction or has yearly audits that are uh, surrounding that. So that's a really nice add on. And I'm really good, really glad to see that Microsoft has put that in there. So as a quick view of the Azure Defender um, portal here. So you can see that, you know, very similar to what we saw inside of uh, Defender Advanced Threat Protection. Um, we can see that we've got a similar dashboard type view for security alerts. In this example, we can see that we're kind of following along the MITRE framework, which is great because this is going to line up to any type of, you know, security, uh, security operations framework that you're building for your organization. And so we can see that that's breaking into the different uh, the different domains that you have, like credential access, persistent, initial access. How are they trying to get in there? And then you can drill into the incidents and you can see uh, more information from there. And the beauty of this is, is this spans your Azure tenant um, beyond just your your cloud based resources with Azure Arc and integrating in that fashion. We can take and we can have our Azure Stack HCI VMs protected. By default, now um, Azure Stack uh, HCI is Azure Arc integrated. So with Azure Arc integration, we've got capabilities of taking and supporting this. Almost as simple as what you saw uh, Cosmos in his demo with Azure Monitor, the kind of the one button click push downs or Azure policies. Uh, the same plays for Azure Defender on the security side as well. So. The ability to take and seamlessly deploy this across multi-site workloads for uh, Azure Stack HCI, protecting the hosts themselves, as well as the workloads that are running on those are absolutely key. Because if you're not doing that, then you're leaving very big holes inside of your infrastructure. So this, this level of you know, mods or add-ons that are coming down via Azure Stack HCI, to me are really, really cool because I've lived in the world of hyper-converged infrastructure with Microsoft since its inception in server 2016, had many customers running on 2016, had many customers running on, on 2019, and now seeing the evolution moving over to Azure Stack HCI. All of those pieces that we had where we had to manually button up or fill holes are kind of automatically being taken care of inside of the Azure Stack HCI portfolio. And Azure Defender is just one great example of what that's looking like for us. So for somebody who had to do this the manual way for the last five, six years, seeing the automation behind this is absolutely fantastic. And I, I'm super excited for this. And I, I'm really glad that Microsoft is taking security extremely serious because when an organization gets hit, it's not pretty. It, it's, it really is not pretty. And you're, you're for lack of better terms, being being wound down to you know the, the beginning of time for that organization, depending on how bad that is. So having the ability with Azure Stack HCI to not only protect with uh, Azure Defender, having Azure Site Recovery integration. So now I can have, you know, I have the ability to now fail over to Azure in the event that something happens. These are all great moves in the right direction and, and really building um, upon that seamless infrastructure that we're looking for. Like I said, this, ex this is an extension out of um, Azure Security Center. So out of Security Center inside of your portal, you can see the protection is available inside of there for not only your server workloads. If you've got AKS uh, instances in there, if you've got app services, if you've got storage accounts, uh, if you've got PaaS instances for SQL databases, um, all of that is going to take and uh, be supported for you. And we'll, I hate to use the word that one single pane of glass, but this is really what we're heading towards from a security perspective, is that one place, one home for all of this, instead of having this kludgy multi-tool, uh, you know, run a script on this to get it working and run a script on that. No, we want one seamless experience and to have this be able to be turned on kind of out of box is, uh, is really cool. 
All right, so availability for this with the extensions that Cosmos was talking about in his presentation via Azure Arc integration. You can have Azure only, Azure and on-prem with, for example, Azure Stack HCI or other on-prem workloads. You could even extend this out to other clouds. Maybe your organization is using AWS or Google Cloud or other clouds that are out available. As long as those can communicate up with your with your portal and you've opened up those firewall rules to allow those uh, FQDNs to be available, they're there. And in the and in the three the the three prong scenario where we've got uh, Azure cloud based resources, we've got other clouds and on prem Azure Stack HCI, for example all are fully uh, supported scenarios. Now, outside of Azure itself, Azure itself is probably the easiest way to turn this on because it's almost like the extensions are, are there and available for us. Um, the, the deployment to anything outside of that, we're looking at Azure Arc-based um, integration for that. Um, Azure Defender is kind of the on-off version. And this is, this is interesting, I always like you know, I've worked in IT for 25 years, and and I I still I still love the way that we come up with um, some of our naming for some of the features and the way that we do things. So um, Azure Defender Off is kind of like free mode, and Azure Defender On is the paid mode. And inside of the paid mode, down below, when you click through your portal, so you're going to go through. Uh, I think it's inside of the settings tab for Azure Defender. Um, you can see the pricing sheet that's inside of there. So I was seeing today, I, I pulled the, the pricing. I never like to get into pricing discussions because I never claim to be a licensing or pricing expert. I just, I'm the mechanic that puts this all together and is, is told to, you know, make it turn faster or keep the wheels on. And so, you know, it appears right now for my subscription, it was about 15 bucks a month for a server from a protection standpoint. And, you know, that's pretty similar to the SKU for that I saw for uh, Defender ATP as well. So that was similar to the pricing that we saw uh, when we were doing this for our uh, old way Gen 1 of doing this. Got some cool auto provisioning capabilities inside of there. So. Uh, like Cosmos was talking about all the different extensions that are available. So this is the same type of idea to be able to turn on different um, extensions. So once the agent's in there, we can basically turn on and flip on different features. So this is pretty cool. Um, there'll be email, you know, you've got options in here to have all your email notifications and workflows, and you can change the way that the wording looks like on the alert emails. And, you know, we really live by this. And in some of the infrastructure that we've deployed this, I've been running uh, Defender ATP on server-based infrastructures and desktop endpoint-based infrastructure now for probably the better part of three plus years for a lot of customers that I support. And uh, in line, the question I always get asked is, does it work? And I say, well, if there's nothing perfect, nothing's that gonna stop potentially everything 100% but I'd rather be in the 95th percentile than you know, be in the fifth percentile and have nothing. I know what one particular customer we've stopped in line with, uh, with Defender ATP, probably about 15 um, direct ransomware attacks. I've got an organization that seems to love to go plug in USB sticks that they get from who knows where, and it's pretty easy to get elevation when you've got those USB sticks like that. Since since then, we've done further lockdowns that I'll talk about towards the end of the presentation. But um, you want to make sure that you're taking you're protecting all of that infrastructure that you're looking after. All right. So a couple kind of closing thoughts that I have probably have about another um, eight to ten minutes here, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, I want to talk about some of the current threats that are out there and what we've seen in the last 18 months with COVID-19. I don't know if in your organization, if you really paid attention to the uptick in ransomware attacks since COVID-19, but man, oh man, for the threat actors that were out there, there, were, uh, there was a lot of low hanging fruit because this was the phone call that we got in, I think it was March, of 2020 when COVID kind of first went mainstream, we started with all of the lockdowns. I remember the date because I had just gotten back. My daughter was in a cheer competition in Nashville. And as soon as we landed, that was when everything shut down. I remember that because that was last time I was on a plane. It was March of 2020. 
Um, <laughs> so, so anyways, um, what ended up happening is we got phone calls from the organization saying, listen, I've got, I've got 8,000 people here and, and I need to send them home. Everybody is working from home. And we have, we're like in IT, we're like, uh, we don't really have VPN set up for 8,000 people. No, you need to get VPN remote access set up right now. Well, it's going to take some time to secure all of that. No, don't worry about the security. Just make sure that people can log in from home. Well, are you sure that's a good idea? Because that's going to probably leave a lot of holes. No, we don't care. Open it up. People need to work. Okay, you're the boss. You sign the check. Here, sign the waiver that says Dave's not responsible for turning this on. So <laughs> it left a lot of holes that were out there. And so we found that there was tons of open RDP connections because organizations were just opening up RDP and leaving open endpoints on the internet, not just enough access, like wide open on the internet. Those endpoints, those VPN endpoints weren't secured at all. So there was no ATP on them. So who knows what people were doing at home on um, those systems, those corporate systems that kids were probably doing homework and on whatever sites and probably not the best thing to be doing for corporate devices. So we found that the, those VPNs became a big entry point coming across because there was no port lockdowns. It was just like you were on a full extension of the infrastructure just because the IT teams couldn't keep up. So what type of mess are we left with? Well, the, the wave of you know ransomware attacks that are out there. The other thing we kind of change gears here a little bit is dev test environments actually really kind of tick me off. You know, I, I've, I've got a bit of a beef with dev test environments because we like to think that these dev test environments that live on, on in our infrastructure are, you know, they're just something that, you know, we don't have to pay attention to security on. And that's absolutely not the case because the first question I've got for you does that lab environment connect to a production network somewhere? Oh yeah, the VLAN's completely routable. We can take and get to the lab environment because all the developers need to push code up to those things all the time. Okay, is it in a separate domain? Well, you know, we've been thinking about that, but it's actually inside of the production domain. So it's not really a lab environment, it's really production, okay? Well, hopefully you do have a separate domain and you've got pre-prod, prod, dev test, you've got all of that stuff set up, but make sure you isolate those environments, please. And just because it's running on something like Azure Stack HCI, just because it's running inside of your Azure tenant, it still needs to be secured and locked down. Make sure you're controlling what those things have access to, because if you don't, and there, you could actually inadvertently provide yourself a jump box for a bad guy, a threat actor, who can reverse port his way back through your, your production infrastructure. So don't leave those unseen holes inside of the dev test environments. We're finding that there's a lot of problems there when we're going through security audits with customers right now. And also make sure that you're putting the same level of advanced threat protection in the lab environments. I don't care if it costs a little bit more money. If that's a server and it's on the network, it needs to be protected. If you're not gonna protect it, get it off my network because I don't want it on there. And so you, just, you need to kind of take that approach as you're looking at um, kind of modernizing your, your, security, uh, your security footprint. All right, uh, I think I got three slides left here and then we'll take some questions. So ransomware exists and a virtual show of hands, if you've had a customer that's been impacted by ransomware or you are that customer that's been impacted by ransomware. And at this point in time in a live presentation, sheepishly about 75 percent of the the attendees kind of slowly put up their hands and so the reality of it is is that this is not getting any any better it's only getting worse and just because you're in the cloud it does not mean that you're ransom proofing your your organization just because you've got azure arc integration doesn't mean that you're ransom proofed you still need to be diligent about your cyber defenses you need to be testing your cyber defenses if you're not familiar with concepts of like red teaming and blue teaming exercises, you need to do some research on this. And I also throw a new one in and Karsten, you're gonna love this. I just made something up, I call it cloud teaming. So you need a third team, it's called cloud teaming to go with your red team and your blue team. And so you need to test those defenses. You need to test Azure Stack HCI defenses. You need to test 
Azure Arc defenses. If I tell you that these things can be turned on with Azure Defender, you need to test this. Don't just turn it on. You need to make sure that it actually works. I know it looks like one button that you're pressing to turn it on, but you still need to test it and validate it. So make sure that you build those pieces in when you're taking and you're you're setting up your infrastructure. So remember, you got a new team, you got a cloud team now. All right, uh, I've got about five minutes left here, two slides, and so I want to walk you through uh, the Monday morning call that I got on July 2nd. So July 2nd, um, my phone rings and it's it's from a weird number. I hadn't gotten a phone call from them before. It's from, a, I live in Calgary and I got a number from, it was a Toronto number that I got a call from. And I was like, well, that's weird, 9 a.m. to have a, a phone call from, from this particular phone number. If for my European friends, this would be like uh, you're in Germany and you're getting a phone call from Sweden. It's like, well, I kind of maybe have some friends in Sweden, I'm not sure. Um, and so the conversation went something like this. Uh, we're in bad shape. Uh, we need help right now. Okay, what can I do for you? Well, have you heard of Kaseya? No, what's going on with Kaseya? It was the weekend. I was out dirt biking in the mountains. There was no cell phone service. That's why I go there. I don't want cell phone service. <laughs> and so I come back Monday morning to find out that the biggest ransom attack in history had just been launched. And I said, well, okay, well, how bad is it? Well, I, I got a couple customers that are here. Okay, well, I've, I've heard this before. I'm like, a couple customers? What do you mean you got a couple customers? He's like, well, I actually got all of our customers all of your customers how many is all of your customers well that's like 80. oh that's bad yeah the whole team's all hands on deck and well how bad was it did they get backups oh yeah they got everything they got backups they got uh they got all the replicas they got all the production servers they got active directory well that's a question i asked earlier about the fabric did they have a fabric nope how bad was the attack oh it was a system-wide attack oh goody that's fun and so the, then you start going through the calls with the insurance provider and the insurance provider is like, okay, don't worry, we've got dedicated security instant response team that's gonna look after this. Two days go by, nothing happens. Well, we're really busy with this Kaseya incident and you know we'll get to you when we can. Three days go by, nothing. Um, and that's kind of where I jumped in was at like day three of this and they were down. And so by the time we discovered that there was no path out, there was no backups, there was there was nothing for us to come back to. Now we've got to negotiate payment. And this is where it gets really interesting for all of our uh, US based customers, because I don't know if you paid attention to the news today. There's just been sanctions that are being put to prevent ransomware uh, payments to crypto wallets. So just because you think you can pay, you might not even be able to pay you might not be allowed to pay. So you want to pay big attention to this. So we as Canadians, we didn't have those sanctions, so we paid. Um, if you're wondering what the going rate was, it was $55,000 US per server or 5 million for the organization. So if you want a number to throw at this, that was the number. Um, the recovery effort took probably about 10 weeks. We were all hands on deck for our organization for this one um, company. And uh, cyber insurance actually did cover the costs. Now, will they continue to cover the costs? I don't know, because that was a big hit on the industry. So you really want to pay attention to uh, your policies and make sure that you still got coverage. Um, they're putting riders in those cyber insurance policies now that you have to do things like put MFA, you have to pass a security audit, you've got to do a bunch of things. If you don't do that, void your policy, okay? And so the last thing is, what if you don't pay? Well, you have nothing. That's what you've got left with is nothing. Maybe you go to some type of recovery service, but it doesn't look good. So this is why I'm so serious about these discussions around ransom and advanced threat protection. Um, just some quick statistics for you is that 55% of small businesses typically pay. And this is from a very reputable organization. Know before you probably know this organization. Uh, 20 billion in, in damages caused by ransomware. If you're a US-based organization, you're more than uh, well aware of the, of the pipelines that were hit. Um, ransomware 2.0 is potentially actually a ransomware less attack where they don't actually ransom your data, they just steal everything and they threaten to release it. So instead of going through all the legwork of doing that, and uh, this is just continuing to get worse and worse and worse. So some interesting statistics. 
And so some takeaways for everyone, if you don't have advanced threat protection, you want to be looking at Azure Defender today, you want to make sure that you're getting ATP and EDR set up. Remember, antivirus alone is not enough. Um, it's also not enough to run everything in a single domain. This, this seems really weird to me, right? Because for years, you know, from an Active Directory perspective, we're like, oh, you have too many domains. You're, you're the old MT4 style of domains with PDCs here and a BDC for you. And every site has its own different domain and structure. And you need to consolidate that for a single management uh, surface. And so, well, the only thing we did is we just made it easier with a single attack surface for the bad guys. And so when we were going through those discussions all those years ago for AD migrations, <laughs> we were thinking about, you know, ease of management, not security. And so from a security perspective, you should have two domains. Second domain, we call it fabric. You put your, your key resources in there. That's where you're gonna put things like your Azure Stack HCI, your S2D clusters. Have a separate one if you want for your backup targets and make sure that you're taking and protecting because in the event that you do get attacked, you wanna make sure that it is at least recoverable. Um, implementing a zero trust configuration. I don't even know why we have this discussion anymore. Um, domain admins is still God. So domain admins by default is uh, is still the account that can log on to pretty much anything. A domain admin only needs to log into a domain controller. OK, so the, the principle of zero trust is breaking that apart. It's really simple, really simple. Domain admins only need to log into domain controllers. Server admins need to log into servers and desktop admins need to log into desktops. Desktop admins don't log into servers. Server admins don't log into desktops and domain admins only log into domain controllers. And there you have it. Zero trust in a nutshell for you. You need to do that, all right? Um, the next thing is multi-factor authentication is actually being required by a lot of insurance policies right now. So make sure that you're taking and you're looking into that if you're, if you're not doing it right now. I'm actually a really big fan uh, for some of our infrastructure. I, I don't like to really name drop vendors and stuff, but Cisco Duo does a really good job. They've actually got a free account set up for up to 10 administrative accounts. So especially for a fabric where we have limited number of admin accounts, Cisco Duo is, is really good. We like it. Um, and enjoy the rest of the show. I really have to thank Karsten and the entire crew there for taking the time to put on this event for the community. I know there's a ton of effort that goes into it. And I just, I really thought you'd enjoy the icon that the AI picked up for enjoy the rest of the show. So you enjoy the rest of the show from your beds. And so with that, I think we'll take some, some Q and A and hopefully you enjoyed the session. Yes, I enjoyed it very much, Dave. Thank you so much. And with as with all security sessions, you are after that you are you are speechless. So <laughs> is there still hope to protect anything for at least a small company? Like I, I'm a I'm a three three person company. Uh, it seems like a lot of work, uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, um, uh, how you um, how you call it the admins different to all of this this is the a lot of lot of work that you have to do right well and i think if you're not going to uh go through the effort of zero trust with actually locking that down and there's some really great guides out there my good friend sammy laiho does some great talks on how to lock these things down uh same mike neistrom does some great talks on it as well but um at least have different accounts carson so don't be logging in as your daily driver account doing administrative work so your I daily drive that. your daily driver account is just for email have a separate laptop set up that you just do your email on and when you go to do admin stuff just work on your admin stuff on there and one of the things that i didn't mention in the session was the requirement to internet connect servers okay this is really important to me because uh, servers typically don't need to connect to the internet because they're typically used for in internal things. So I'll, I'll, if I've got an Azure Arc extension on a server, great, I'll maybe open up those ports to the cloud, but that's it. Those things don't need to generically talk to everything. So start locking that down. If you don't need browsers on your servers, remove browsers from your servers. Make sure that they're not there. We can do other things that are very simple to try to protect ourselves inside of here, so yeah. Another question I have, I, I know you and I, we are uh, in another community program uh, and uh, it's about backup. So uh, 
would it would it had helped your customer if they had a a cloud backup maybe with uh, immu build I, I I don't get the word out immu you know what I mean right immutability um, yeah yeah would that be helpful or did the attackers wait for maybe 90 days before they uh, showed up uh, with their demands so for this particular instance um, they had changed managed service providers Karsten and they were still deciding on whether it was a good idea to continue cloud protection so the cloud-based backups that we had were I think four months old so oh. their financial data was lost for four months so I was able to bring back a domain controller from the cloud to at least getting people to log in and get back into office 365 and AD connect and stuff but it was four months old and so um, absolutely having a cloud tiering solution with immutability is really key and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna just uh, take one step back even further and this goes great for the smaller customers out there USB drives take a USB drive back up all your stuff put it in there once a week put it in a lockbox if anything happens I don't care if it's slow to restore at least I have your data from a week ago that USB drive not connected to anything is immutable if it's got no power going to it and nobody can touch it it's immutable and so that's the simplest form of going back to the days of tape or anything like that like we try to get away from this so much but having those forms of offline backup are sometimes a real saving grace so yeah I see people going back to not tape but like removable media mm -hmm. so would you say uh, this is are the Azure Stack HCI days and on Azure Stack HCI you, we have two things you have have to have a connection to Azure at least so mm -hmm. we can open maybe only the connection to Azure but that is not easy because there are multiple IP networks that change so put in the firewall uh, only connect to these addresses is a bit a bit uh, hard to do you can do a VPN uh, but that's expensive if you have your VPN in, in Azure um, uh, that's maybe a bad thing for security the other thing you have only a a core installation so no uh, no browser on on the desktop or, or on the lock-in screen so this is I think good and the other thing is maybe bad what what would you say or how would you well, handle all these Azure uh, different Azure networks you don't know what to connect well it's going to be a bit of a moving target for you so you kind of have to watch your firewalls to see what's being blocked from those devices and to to screen that because the unfortunate reality is if you're not getting all of those firewall rules open properly your connectivity um, downstream to your azure sec hci clusters is going to be impacted so it, it's something that i don't think you can just set and forget i think it, it adds management overhead for sure um, in regards to the, the conversation of a core OS, um, it's not when things are working for me. I don't get called in typically when things are working. I get called in when things are broken. And so yeah. when things are broken, it is just a fact of reality that it's harder to troubleshoot in a core installation. Um, I'm with you. And, and, and you know, I've had this discussion with Microsoft and Jeff Woolsey is going to beat me up the next time we have this conversation, but it's not when it's working. It's when it's not that's the problem. And so, you know, it kind of is what it is. It's the platform that it is. But at the end of the day, it's harder to troubleshoot core than it is GUI. OK, so uh, same with me. Uh, for me, uh, the core, uh, Azure Stack HCI, the core, uh, core con console is much harder because we need some PowerShell uh, commands direct on the console, for example, with uh, storage, uh, storage, uh, storage replica partnerships and so on, BitLocker, whatever you do, you have to do it on the console, and it's much harder without any good editor and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, absolutely. Oh, now we have a split screen. We can do that. Yeah. I just ended the presentation. <laughs> okay, we are both in the picture. Yeah, Dave. Thanks so much. It's only a minute away to our next. Uh, to our next presentation. I will send you a mail. I have an idea, but uh, we will do that offline. OK, sounds Dave? good. Sounds good. My Thanks friend. so Thanks much everyone. for being here and the support of, of our Azure Stack HCI days and great presentation. But I think the audience is a little bit tired. This was the sixth <laughs> hour already and we have only five hours to go. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds good. Everyone. Well, remember, it's all recorded. You can catch it afterwards. It is and it was a great one.